Hi, I'm Kara Rita. And I'm Wendy Walker. Welcome to our Thriller Fest video on character development in thrillers. Kara has written women's fiction and romance novels, but her favorite thing to write is what we now call domestic or psychological suspense. Her best-selling novels include her debut, Best Day Ever, and The Favorite Daughter. And next year, she has The Second Wife followed by Somebody's Home. Kara lives in both Orange County and Washington, D.C. with her husband, Congressman Harley Ruda, and their four 20-something grown-up children. When Kara isn't writing or hanging out with her family, you'll now find her gardening, a passion she's rediscovered with the stay-home orders or walking on the beach with her dogs or doing yoga. Kara also has one of the brightest smiles I've ever seen, and she is outrageously funny. Wendy has written four psychological thrillers, All Is Not Forgotten, Emma in the Night, The Night Before, and Don't Look For Me, which comes out in September. It's great. She used to be a divorce lawyer, and much of what she learned during those years about psychology plays into her books. She lives in Southern Connecticut with her three sons, though two were in college before the pandemic. When she isn't writing, she's hanging out with girlfriends, running, rowing, or doing yoga, or reading books by other authors to offer praise for their promotion. She wishes she had more hobbies and is open to suggestions. I have one my friend, gardening, it's really fun. Anyway, that's about Wendy. We're here today to talk about character development in psychological suspense. Not only why it's so important, but we'll share some tools and tricks we use to get the job done. So let's dive in and talk about why character development is so important even when you're writing a fast-paced thriller. Action alone cannot hold a reader's interest. We need to find a protagonist we can root for and an antagonist to hate, or in the case of my unreliable narrators, who I love to write. Perhaps he or she is the same person. If I don't connect with the characters, I'll usually stop reading. And that's true even with a thriller. I have to care about the character to care about what happens to that character. When I say that you have to care about a character, that's not the same thing as having to like the character. The perfect example of this is Gone Girl, a book that most people know about. Pretty much, there wasn't a likable character to be found, and yet, you cared what happened to them because they were so psychologically complex, and the cat and mouse game that was going on was so intriguing that you wanted to know which one of them would win. You became invested in the outcome, even though they weren't likable. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the difference between thrillers and other novels. Caring is not always the same as liking. I'm a pantser, as they call us authors who write by the seat of our pants. My books start with a character who will just pop into my head, which is so fun, quickly followed by a setting and usually a title. With that, I'm off to writing. But that said, as I begin to fill the screen with my words, my protagonist likely will need some other people in his or her life. And once those people begin to pop into my head, I have my cast. That's when I stop and use a little character development tool I learned along the way. Each one of my main characters must fill out a questionnaire to remain in the story, so to speak. I um, like to think of it as something to make me stop and kind of get organized as well. So here's what we do. We do the character questionnaire. So pretend like you're one of my characters. Question number one is, what do you want and what are the stakes? That's a really important question. Each character must want something. And the main character in a thriller wants something so much that they'll do almost anything to get it. This is an important question, probably the most important question. And the stakes, the stakes that your character is dealing with, that has to be the biggest thing. What will happen if the character doesn't get what she wants? Dire consequences should follow. All right, character questionnaire number two. What or who is the ghost in your past? Yes, you know we all have them. Okay, so the next question my character must answer is what or who is the ghost in the past? Characters need backstory information. 
And that information must be dribbled out through the story. The key to me, I try to remind myself, is that all backstory should be an active, compelling scene. So when you write a, a backstory scene, make it action-oriented so it feels still moving the story forward. Maybe your character murdered someone and got away with it, but is haunted in the present day. Maybe your character had a rotten childhood. Perhaps the ghost of the past is a former lover, or whatever you or your character imagines it to be. Make sure every character has a ghost in his or her past, because as you know, we all do. Question number three for the characters in your suspense and thriller novel. Somewhere in the story, you will realize you were wrong about what you want, but you will figure out a new goal. What will that be? Here's the part of the questionnaire where you might not be able to fill it in right away. At least I can't always. My characters don't necessarily know that they're going to be foiled. So it's a tricky question, but it's also perhaps the most valuable. In these changed goals, you'll find some of your best story twists and revelations. In today's thriller and suspense market, it's crowded. Readers have read a lot of different stories and they're really on to a lot of the twists that we've all become familiar with. So they want your story to feel fresh. You want your character's actions to seem natural and unique. Their goals perhaps unusual, or if not, their pivots to be unpredictable. That's what makes for a great story. So good luck with that. Character questionnaire number four. Question four. What do you learn by the end of the story, oh character of mine? Like real people, we all learn and grow every day. So must your characters. They have to change by the end of the story. That's what's called the character arc. I like to try to figure out what my main characters, at least, will learn by the end of the story ahead of time. I just jot down little notes while they do as they're answering the questionnaire. But like I said, this is all fluid because I'm a pantser, and sometimes, oftentimes, they will just surprise me, and I, I don't even know what they're up to until the end of the story. Wendy, I'm guessing this process is a little different from what you do, because you are a big plotter. So why don't you tell us some of your secrets for making a character really, really stand out? Go ahead, Wendy. Another way to develop characters is to plant the foundation for who they were before the story even began. This can help the reader connect with the character as if that character were a real person. So it's important to give them traits that we all look for when we first meet someone to see whether or not this is a person we will care about. One of the things I like to do is to make a list for each of my characters just naming some small traits about them that will send a signal to the reader about what this character is like inside. For example, does she choose Chardonnay or Scotch? Does she sleep through the night or is she an insomniac? Does she love animals or do they drive her crazy? If someone cuts her off on the road, does she say, oh, I'm sorry, or does she have road rage? These are the types of things that can send a message very quickly and efficiently to your reader about what type of person this character is. And when you're writing a thriller, this is really important. You need to be efficient when you are moving away from the plot to the character development. Another way to send a message to your reader about the type of person your character is is through the use of first-person narration. And the way you do that is through your choice of language. So while your character is telling the story of the plot, the words that are chosen by your character will say a lot about who that person is. For example, is your character very meticulous and educated and does she think very highly of herself? Well, then she might choose sentences that are perfectly structured, grammatically correct, and use words that are bigger words than you might normally use in everyday conversation. On the other hand, if your character is very gritty, you might choose sarcasm, you might choose expletives, you might choose choppy sentences 
that are not grammatically correct, that use some slang to show the type of person your character is. You can also achieve this either in first person or third person through the use of internal thoughts. And they don't have to be thoughts about the plot that are giving away clues for the plot. Instead, they can just be quick internal thoughts that your character has as he or she encounters situations or other characters throughout the course of the novel and the thoughts that are provoked. For example, if your character runs into his brother who is perfectly dressed and has everything together, does he think how much he hates his brother or does he think how much he envies his brother? That will send a message about whether your character is insecure or whether your character has resentment and bitterness towards his brother. So through the use of internal thoughts, you can do a lot of character development, again, that gets to the heart of your character, the person that this character is before the book even starts. And that will help your reader attach to the character and care about the character, even if they don't like this character, because they will know this character. And when we know someone, we tend to become invested in the outcome. So what we'd like to do now is give you some examples of characters that you probably know from popular books and films and culture and demonstrate uh, the techniques that we're talking about. So Kara, do you wanna go first? Sure. So one of my favorite movies lately called The Gift. Um, Jason Bateman's in it, but the most creepy character is Gordo. So this young couple moves back to his hometown, Jason Bateman's, and they move into this house. And all of a sudden, they, this guy from the husband's past shows up. They went to high school together, and his name is Gordo. And he starts, the, you know, the, the wife doesn't have any friends yet, so he starts befriending her, and he'll bring, like, little trinkets and things. And the way the characters developed, it's so benign at first. I mean, you think Gordo's just coming and being friendly, like welcome wagon, welcoming them back to the neighborhood. And then you slowly realize, because it's a slow burn, that he has other things in mind. And I won't give it away, but the way that the characters developed is it just little... Um, I guess like character facial expressions, the way that he, he walks, the way he acts, like he, how he's kind of sneaky. It's just a remarkable way of bringing that character to life. It's, it's a great, it's a great movie and great technique. Love it. Okay. So the first one I'm going to use is from um, one of my favorite books, which is Wuthering Heights. And in the very first paragraph, we are given some attributes of Heathcliff that immediately tell you that he's a dark, brooding character. First of all, he calls him a capital fellow with an exclamation point. This is a first person narration. So the, the choice of language, which is again, something that I talked about, um, also tells you something about your narrator. So he's calling him a capital fellow with an exclamation point. So now you know that our narrator identifies with Heathcliff. Then we learn that Heathcliff has black eyes that withdraw so suspiciously under their brows. And when his fingers sheltered themselves, it was with a jealous resolution. And so we already sense that he's a dark brooding character with a lot of backstory that's kind of ugly. And we know that our narrator relates to him. This one of my favorite um, binge watching series is Dead to Me. I don't know if you've watched that, but okay, so you've got Jen and Judy, and Jen's like a mess because she's uh, her husband's been killed in this hit and run, and or her ex husband, and then all of a sudden she meets Judy at this grief counseling. Um, session and they become unlikely friends and what's what's amazing to me about these characters is they're both kind of a mess <laughs> and you, you when you meet them they're they're obviously messy and so you start caring about them right away you even though both of them have done pretty pretty terrible things along the way and and one of them more than others really I guess that's an example of both plot and characters kind of working together at the same time to really propel a story so I'll go to a TV show. This is from a few years back, um, the second season of True Detective, which I know is controversial. It didn't, got mixed reviews, but 
Rachel McAdams uh, plays a female detective in that series. And the first time we meet her, she ha is coming out of her bedroom. She's been with a man and she's all business. She straps on her gun, is making coffee. And he comes out and is sort of shell-shocked by the kind of sex they had. But she's sort of like, deal with it. And it's just, and, and he's so taken aback. And I just, there's something about that that you instantly know that she's super edgy, got a little bit of, of darkness inside her. And within you know a minute of that scene, you know so much about her. Yeah. Okay, well, I was kind of torn because I, I really love Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, and the problem is that the character is the whole town, and so I guess I guess I will talk about that. So it's a short story, a famous short story, as you as you guys all know. But what I love about it is you you kind of you start out and it's it's the scene set as if this is you know it's this town's rite of passage, the lottery every every year, and it's it's they attach it to the harvest, and if you have a good lottery, you have a good harvest. And it starts out with this tone and tempo where the characters, you just kind of see them from afar because they're all coming together to this thing. And it, in a sense, the whole crowd becomes this massive character. And it kind of, it's so poignant now <laughs> as well as when it was written because this crowd mentality and the way a crowd went, if you're part of this crowd, no matter what you're doing, it's okay because he's doing it and he's doing it and she's doing it. That, I don't know, it just speaks to me. I, I read it quite often because it's just such a powerful example. And in, in, in another set way to me, and I guess I like these kind of stories, these kind of um, worlds that are created, is when a character is, seems one thing and what they're doing seems to be benign again, just drawing a lottery. And then it turns into something far, far more sinister and, and deep. And that is the character, this mob. I have one more, and that is Tom from um, The Talented Mr. Ripley. Yeah. And in the first chapter, when you meet Tom, by the end of the chapter, you know he's a sociopath. And the reason you know that is because it, in one breath, he's, ha he's having an internal thought um, about hating this man. And then the next internal thought is this guilt at wanting to leave because the man just got poured a fresh drink and he doesn't leave because he feels, he feels guilty leaving this man there with a fresh drink and no one to sit with him. And so he stays there. There's a, a sociopathic uh, personality and that they are also tied to his self-esteem. Um, and it's fascinating that if you haven't read that book and you're writing uh, psychological suspense, it is a master class. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching our Thriller Fest video on character development in thrillers. Kara, it was wonderful to see you virtually. Yes, wonderful to see you too, Wendy. Thank you for watching this whole thing. I hope that you learned a lot. I know I did, and we had fun being together, and hopefully we'll be all together in person next Thriller Fest. Yeah, see you then.